Well, hello, everybody. We're very, very glad you were all able to make it today. This is the third session of Gamert's March Mini Conference on TTRPGs and Libraries. My name is Thomas Vos. I'm the past president of the Games and Gaming Roundtable. And um, very glad that it's, we have so many folks here to join us today. Now, this session will run from now until 1.45, and it is being recorded and live streamed to Twitch. All recordings of sessions will be available on our Twitch channel after the event. Copies of the slides for presentations are linked in the conference group resource doc, which will be linked in chat and actually has. It. And for this session, we will have four short presentations followed up by a Q&A. So if you have any questions for the presenters, please let us know who that question is directed to and please use the Zoom Q&A function. And if you've never used the Zoom Q&A feature before, please see the note about it that is being added to chat. Has it been added to chat? It'll get there. And if you are watching on Twitch, our tech team will snag your questions to add to the Zoom Q&A. So that all said, let's get started. Eric, are you all set? Indeed, I am. Awesome. Okay, uh, then our, our first presenter is Erica Roberts with Storytelling Over Stats and Bumblebees Over Battles. Why Wander Home could be the best RPG for your library. So let me go ahead. Oh, I need to um, get sharing permissions. Yes. Yeah. So currently somebody else is sharing this. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Yeah. Now we're really, um, hang on just a second here. And I think I might have it. Oh, you've already got it. Never mind. <laughs> You're I, uh, I took um, Hello? Zoom classes. Uh, so I'm, I'm pretty good at the whole sharing over zoom thing at this point okay um oh don't know why it's on that slide try again there we go okay so um this is my presentation uh we will be covering the benefits of playing rpgs why play rpgs at your library why play wonder home in particular uh cover setting up wonder home gameplay and then i have a couple slides with reviews and further reading so on with our journey uh, Wonder Home is a new enough game that no academic research has really come out about it yet, so these sources focus more on D&D, the most researched uh, role-playing game, but the benefits do apply to both D&D and um, Wonder Home and most other RPGs. So we are first talking about collaboration and teamwork. D&D uh, &D gameplay is often uh, shown the best performance from a party that has diverse skills, uh, that is a range of skills and abilities. Members with both both close range and far range attacks, for instance, or party members who can't fight, but can heal or buff other players combined with a number of fighters. Um, and then also, of course, D&D is cooperative rather than competitive play. The goal of D&D is to work together so players learn to cooperate, to build relationships both in games and in real life, and compromise when necessary. Um, problem solving. Uh, there's obviously multiple solutions. As I mentioned before, compromise can often be necessary when playing D&D. When multiple people are trying to solve the same problem, you often have different perspectives, giving different solutions. Um, there's always space for alternative suggestions. If one player wants to try and negotiate while another wants to start a fight, the group might start by trying to talk, and then if that fails, starting a fight. Um, character building, both literally and metaphorically. Uh, you're literally building a character from the stats up. What are they good at? What are they bad at? What's their moral alignment? What might their backstory be to explain why? But also metaphorically, um, what do you, the player, want to see in your character? Something very similar, something very different to yourself. Uh, what kind of morals do you want to drive your character? And then in choosing your character's moral alignment, the lawful, neutral, chaotic, and the good, neutral, evil scales, respectively, players have to consider how their characters would respond to an ethical or a moral dilemma. Sometimes characters are closely aligned with the player's own morals, but sometimes characters aren't. And then the player has to consider what their character would do in this situation rather what they would do. And of course, sometimes a character has better morals than the players feel that they themselves have, and thus the players can practice aspirational behavior. Um, you know, if I was as good as or as strong or other positive traits inserted here as my character, what would I do? Even if the player isn't as good or strong or other positive trait here as their character, they may end up bringing some of those characteristics and decision making into their real life after enough practice doing so as the character. D&D is also a space that offers distance from real consequences while making decisions and taking risks, providing a testing ground for those decisions and risks. It can give players the confidence to try, to try new things, to try risky things, to try uncomfortable things, and see what happens. Um, so D&D can also be a space to vent or feel emotions through the character, thus giving a player space to feel emotions without being overwhelmed by them. 
Um, empathy and tolerance, uh, connection with fellow players and NPCs, since gameplay is often very focused on characters caring, whether about the mission, about their values, about their teammates, or about NPCs. And practicing that caring throughout the game can help build empathy and tolerance for people you spend real life with as well. Both your teammates and NPCs you start to spend a lot of time with show depth over time, and it helps you navigate the real world. Um, the power of na narrative and the imagination. So of course, RPGs are often played on the power of imagination. Sometimes there are props to help visualize events, maps, character tokens, miniatures, etc. but plenty can be done with just character sheets and a good GM. The game is supported by the players getting to imagine what's going on, what a good solution could be, how their characters would react and why. RPGs are a good way to fire up any player's creativity and imagination. Um, humanity has always been connected by stories and RPGs are, not, are just another more involved way to tell them. RPGs can often be the story of underdog heroes fighting against an overwhelming evil and succeeding, offering hope even in the darkest of times. RPGs can also have smaller scale stories, quieter, more peaceful stories that offer hope that not everything has to be a battle and that there can be peaceful futures to find as well. Whatever stories players want to hear or tell, RPGs are an opportunity to tell them and be inspired by them. So probably not a speech I have to give to any attendees at this conference, but in case you might need a handy list of reasons to argue for including RPG programming at your lab uh, for any skeptics. Um, it's a fun way to forge friendships. Uh, working together towards a common goal unsurprisingly brings a group of people together. Just as it happens in the game, so too it often happens for the players themselves. And people who are strangers at the beginning of the game can end up with lifelong friends. Uh, it subsidizes material costs because the materials for playing RPGs, especially all the D&D manuals, can get very pricey very quickly. The library having sets that multiple people can use over time offers an opportunity to people who might be only vaguely interested without them being put off by high costs, and thus widens the pool of potential program attendees. Um, identity formation, especially for children and teens, role-playing games offer the chance to test out different identities through character building, testing out who they want to be or testing out who they don't want to be. Adults can enjoy this as well, but partic particularly for younger players, this is an important developmental minds milestone that RPGs can help them reach. Um, you can play both virtually and in person. Potentially the most important factor in the midst of quarantine, the flexibility of gameplay can still be very useful. People who want to attend the game but have obligations too close to the beginning or end of the session can call in virtually and still play. Um, it offers an escape from daily life. In the wake of the pandemic, a lot of people are still dealing with what they lost or still feel like they're losing. And RPGs can offer a way to be someone else with someone else's worries for a change, which can help vent stress and emotions from your life in a safe and healthy way. So why Wander Home in particular? Um, of course, the mo most well-known RPG is Dungeons and Dragons for a multitude of reasons, but as good as a game of D&D can be, there are a number of drawbacks when it comes to playing a campaign in a library. Uh, there's a lot of information to keep track of and you know, stats, bonuses, which dice to use when, et cetera, et cetera. Um, which can be both stressful for the DMs and the players, especially for newbies. Uh, DMing a D&D game is a very involved process, both before, during, and after games, which can make first-timing DM DMing very stressful. D&D campaigns tend to build on previous sessions and are built on teamwork. So gameplay is not entirely, but heavily dependent on routine meetups of the same group, which can be difficult if you're playing at a library. Even if the library games focus on one-shots, building in time for character creation for each one-shot can take up a lot of time from proper play. So, uh, if we're putting aside the drawbacks of D&D, here's some reasons why Wander Home may be a better game. Uh, the game is low conflict, uh, since the world is, the setting is a world healing from violence. This offers a more peaceful and relaxed setting for players who just want to escape their life and don't necessarily want to fight, um, especially in the wake of the pandemic. The low conflict nature of the game makes it easy to age up or down, depending on the age of your intended audience. Uh, I would argue that Wander Home could probably be aged down all the way to late elementary school, although middle school would probably be have an easier time. Uh, rules light, so Wander Home has very few hard and fast rules to remember, really just the one token mechanic, so it's easy for RPG newbies to come in and learn, or for GM newbies to pick up and run with. Um, there's a variety of, ga of gameplay rules. Um, Wander Home can be played solo or in a group, and can even be played with or without a GM actually running things. I would suggest that first time RPG players have a DM, but for those who may want to try without one, essentially the game enables each player to take turns being the GM as necessary. Um, it's a very flexible game in that it's easy to write characters in or out of the session's narrative. This character is off doing something, but hey, here's this new character who's interested in joining the group. 
so players don't have to attend every single session if they can't or feel guilty about halting the game when they can't make it. And then uh, Wonder Home has very open ended and thoughtful character creation. Uh, a D&D &D character comes with a lot of rules and numbers to keep track of. This decision affects that stat and no, you can't do this. You make that decision. But in Wonder Home, character creation uh, often offers a list of options to choose from, which tend to be light on description, but open up a number of interpretations for the player, but also a number of free choice decisions, their own pronouns, making the game quite uh, LGBTQ plus friendly, any name they like, any animal they like, et cetera, et cetera. So speaking of building a character, um, to build your character, you pick a playbook. The book provides 15, the guest book provides an additional nine, and there are plenty of others to be found on the Itch.io page, which I have linked below. Um, and essentially to build your character, you're picking a name, pronouns, your animal, your personality, your look, uh, which usually has three or four characteristics or items, and then prompts and choices, which vary wildly between the playbooks. Um, so for the Guardian specifically, uh, your personality is kind of what you are versus what you are assumed to be. And your prompts and choices are a focus on your ward, uh, how you found them, what about them you die to defend, and items that your ward carries with you, because what defines the guardian character is the ward that they are taking care of. And then once everybody has created their characters, uh, it's time to pick the place that they're traveling to. Um, each place is made up of three natures, which can be literal or metaphorical. The book provides 36. Yes, book provides a number of others. Um, so when you build your place, you're thinking at, thinking about what can the place always do? What are the aesthetic elements? What's the folklore? Are there any smaller forgotten gods? Et cetera, et cetera. So for the metropolis, you can see the nature can describe the literal sprawling city or else any place where there's a large and diverse community. Um, yes. So and then once you've picked your place, um, one of the things that you can choose when you're picking your place is you're making notable kith. So kith are like NPCs in Wanderhome. Uh, each kith should have at least two traits, and there are a bunch of traits provided in the game. Um, so here's an example. Um, shoot, let me just make sure I'm not late. Okay. Um, so kith are NPCs. Da, 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 da. Sorry, I lost track of where I was. So when you're building your kith, you're looking at name, pronouns, what animal they are, a couple of traits, some key relationships, and any other details. So up here, I have a couple examples. Um, of these kits that I've made for the game I'm running. So you have on the one on one side, you have um, Jesse the Lyrebird Bard, and Terry is a pigeon moth tender, who's essentially a male person. Uh, each of them have key relationships with the tavern keep and with each other, as well as some other character building details, such as Terry settling himself at the taverna due to the large stream of kith who come through wanting to send mail, while Jesse enjoys collecting stories from the kith passing through for inspiration for her next song. So you kind of get an idea of what you're looking for when you're making a kit. Uh, once the place has been fully created, notable kit included, it's time to pick a season. Uh, the great arc of the year is composed of five seasons, each of which uh, contains two months and one holiday. And holidays are when each character can choose an advancement for their character to grow or change. And the Wander Home book provides each month's details, as well as alternative holidays for games that continue long enough to cycle through an entire year. Uh, so when you're looking at your month of the season, you're looking for aesthetics, the signs of the month, and your phenomena question. Um, so each season comes with a phenomena question uh, in which the group asks each other a question. And depending on the answers to the question, that will affect uh, future um, months and kind of developments. So like for the month of Firetop, the question is, do you have plans for the future? Marking down how many players have an answer other than no can trigger a phenomena, which in Firetop's case is a dry silt season. That means skipping the month of snow blanket in the next season, since it's too dry for any decent snow. And then there are um, specific questions that any players can ask of themselves or each other. I'm sorry to do this to Erica, but we got one minute left. Okay, no, that's fine. That's actually perfect because we are down to the last few slides, which are the reviews are in, a number of reviews about the game, and further reading, which uh, some sources with further information about the benefits of RPGs and a couple of live play streams. And that's really it. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask in the Q&A or also email me at eroberts at whiteplainsny.gov. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wonderful job, Erica. You certainly sold me. And if you have any questions for Erica, we're going to be doing all the Q&A here at the end of this session. So again, thank you very much. That was really awesome. And now we have our next uh, presenter.
who is Evan Fruhoff, and he is going to be doing the quest for, to creating an accessible D&D experience in your library. Thank you for coming and joining us today. Thanks for having me. I'm uh, really excited to be here. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen um, real quick. Very cool. All right, so let's go ahead. We'll full screen here. Um, well, guys, first off, my name is Evan Fruhoff. I am a library coordinator at USF Sarasota Manatee. Um, I lead a lot of our event programming uh, for our space on campus, and I'm a huge fan of tabletop RPG, specifically D&D and Pathfinder in particular. Um, one of the big issues, though, is especially when we're trying to get folks uh, engaged with tabletop RPGs and especially uh, first time players, um, whether they're trying to DM for the first time or they're just trying to play it all for the first time. Uh, there's a lot of accessibility issues um, regarding uh, material, space usage, knowledge bases, and whatnot. And so we're going to go on a little journey, a little quest here, just a five-minute quick quest, uh, just to sort of explore the opportunities that libraries can provide to sort of make that process a lot easier for our patrons uh, to engage with these games, as well as uh, give a great uh, activity and uh, resource to a lot of our patrons. Um, so follow with me. Um, I'm going to go ahead. We'll go. I'm going to say this in the best D DM voice I can do. Uh, Twice a year, 2023, where tabletop games thrive, yet the people cannot accessibly play them. Um, it's tragic. I want way more people to play D&D uh, &D in my library. Um, so I want to make sure to find the ways that we could best support those uh, patrons. So first is our common ground. I'll bring you guys to our tavern here. Um, many of our new adventures are lacking the neutral territory to play to gather and play games together. Um, it's requiring a lot of folks to either play on virtual tabletops. Um, it's requiring them to find, uh, to cram themselves in the corner of somebody's house uh, that maybe doesn't have the right space. Maybe there's uh, other family members. I know a lot of times that, uh, especially in RPG games, um, it's a very vulnerable experience, whether you're um, inhabiting a character or you're you know, sharing certain information, you're maybe being a little bit you know, you're getting into your imagination maybe more than you're used to. And so for a lot of new players, that's it's a lot to like do in front of in front of your family or uh, in public specifically. And this is where I think libraries can pop in perfectly, um, especially with libraries that have bookable spaces, whether it's conference rooms, whether it's study rooms and academic libraries. Um, and these are typically at no cost to patrons at all, which puts a huge barrier away from them um, to provide a sort of neutral ground where everyone can gather um, in a safer space um, that has the support of the library staff, um, especially if they can book it those uh, spaces uh, online remotely um, in an accessible way. It makes it really easy to have a guaranteed place uh, to play that has, you know, public access bathrooms, resources, staff that are there to help out if anything happens, that they're there, they've got people who are looking after them, not to mention people who are excited to support them um, as they play. I think it's so important, especially as we consider libraries as third spaces. I know, especially in the academic space, um, our use of third spaces has definitely grown over the last uh, few years, uh, last decade specifically, as we try to cater more to our, being a hub for our campuses. Um, but obviously, public libraries are already doing a lot of this. So um, I think it is a perfect platform um, in regards to common space and a common ground so that our newer players can find a good gathering point or even returning folks um, who are maybe struggling to find that perfect space. We'll continue on, folks, um, to our knowledge base, which here we are in the library of a famous wizard uh, who is a huge, vast library of collections. Now, similar, uh, similarly, D&D uh, &D and many tabletop games of that rate, and then as, as the pre other presenters have talked about, um, a lot of times there's a lot of materials you have to buy that are either expensive or there's multiple volumes or even different iterations of rule sets that you have to acquire in order to just even understand the game. And especially if you're DMing, you want to make sure that you have all of that knowledge base um, and so, so that you can create the best content uh, for your players. Or if it's your first time, just even understanding how to uh, DM and how to share that content with others. So um, with all of these different rule sets, iterations, uh, different, you know, specific things like, our, you know, the monster manual for D&D um, or specific campaign expansions, um, it's really important to be able to have access to those. Otherwise, players are playing with uh, whatever they can find online that maybe isn't officially supported. Maybe it doesn't go into the instructional details. Um, so it can be really, really helpful to have that. And that's a huge area where the library can help out. Having those physical copies on reserve for players to play with, um, maybe multiple copies. Again, 
based on demand uh placed on uh players uh or placed based on by players um but additionally things like workshops um i know at least for my library uh we do a lot of both online and in-person workshops um and that can really bridge that gap uh, to like learning the game not just with the materials themselves um but with the knowledge base and getting people a little bit more comfortable um in the past we've done events like build a character sheet of uh, kind of event uh where Maybe players aren't necessarily playing their first um, campaign, but they're building a character and they understand the basics of what goes into their character from folks who know what they're talking about. Um, this can really help a lot of folks get more comfortable with it, but that can even go to higher levels like DM workshops, which is- Sorry, you haven't been running out of time. Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> Um, and then finally, gearing up. Again, we touched on this just before, but we've got a variety of battle maps, character tokens, and different resources like DM screens to dice. Again, another perfect resource that a lot of these libraries can offer as uh, reserve items. And with all that, it enables the library to offer a wide variety of resources to our patrons at a very low cost to libraries, making the game way more accessible and honestly just a ton of fun and becoming a hub for tabletop games within the library. So there's a lot of ways to make D&D uh, &D and tabletop games more accessible. And uh, I think these are just a few of the great ways to get started. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. It is an accessibility yeah. name of the game for us. So yes, great work. Yeah, right. We sure appreciate that. And we're gonna go ahead and move on to our third presentation, uh, which is, <clears throat> excuse me, entitled Dungeons and Dragons in the Library for Teens. And uh, Nate Wagner is here to talk about that. Okay, thank you. I'm just going to get my screen share up here. All right. Okay. Let me bring this over. Okay, can everyone see that? Okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Dungeons and Dragons in the Library for Teens. I'm Nate Wagner. I'm the librarian at Carroll Stream Public Library. I've been running a D&D &D session for teens as a dungeon master for a weekly program for two years. I've also done a weekly program for adults, uh, but I'll be focusing on this for the for, uh, um, from what I've learned from the teen session. But if you have any questions uh, about what we've been running for adults, uh, we can answer that in the Q&A. Let's see. Okay. I'm going fast here. Why D D? Uh it's trending, as we mentioned before. It's Stranger Things, of course, the new uh movie that's come out. Popular YouTube channels, Twitch channels. There's been a lot of celebrity game sessions that you can watch. Very helpful for when you're learning the game too, which I'll get into later. It's part of a larger renaissance of tabletop gaming, as we've discussed. Uh, very much kind of you might consider it a flagship game of a lot of ta tabletop RPGs. It's economical. That can be costly or in inexpensive as needed. Uh, I've got a um, this is my dice corral. It's cardboard and duct tape. So that's pretty easy. Does the job uh, that keeps the dice from rolling everywhere. Um, it's very collaborative. It's a departure from video gaming, which can be very competitive and can lead to harmful online interactions. We've had incidents in the library where, where we're right across the street from a middle school and we've had some students come in. It was their, their, there's been some bullying. There's maybe some bullying that happened even before school online on a game like Fortnite. So we see a lot of, a lot of tension and hostility um, that, coming to the library as a third space after those interactions. And uh, obviously tabletop uh, gaming offers a, a, an alternative to that. And each player and dungeon master brings their own skills and talents to the game. This is, yeah, bring who you are. Um, you can choose your own pronouns for your character. So your character can match with your pronouns or play a different character with a different identity. Uh, you can maybe they have different values. Um, maybe you're you maybe you want to play a, 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 an evil chaotic character, um, but you want to give them a redemption arc. So it's there's a lot of I come from a performance and music background and improv background. So I can really lean into that stuff. And I see other teens that are interested in kind of the more theater of the mind, the theatrical aspect can really sink their teeth into that. But I struggle more with the, the kind of the analytical and the and the kind of maths part of it. Um, 
Uh, so I, I can show you later how I kind of manage a game session as dungeon master. So there's something for everyone, and they can they can either play themselves or play a character that that they want to express themselves in a different way. Uh, this is from Josh Ships, the grown up grown ups guide to teenage humans. Tabletop top games not only activate your teens' imaginations and brains, but require teamwork and communication. All right, and getting more into the how it interacts with. With the brain science and development, uh, the very act of playing the game encourages the brain to strengthen new neural pathways by making the learner continuously search his memory for information. Even the brains of the, those students only watching the games are firing and wiring thanks to the mirror neurons. Uh, that's from Zaretis Hammond's uh, Culturally Responsive uh, Training in the Brain. That's a different CRT, in case you're wondering. Um, and uh, she expounds in her in her book. She also expounds a lot on how uh, deep culture and cultural archetypes, uh, cultural um, idiosync idiosyncrasies throughout, uh, you know, diverse of uh, student population and many cultures. Uh, things like gaming are a great way to kind of reach those deep cultures and kind of explore explore values. I know from running team sessions, there's been a lot of instances where where the teens will have as players will have philosophical and ethical discussions about where their players should go. And um D, &D promotes uh and this is a this is a screenshot now of Bloom's taxonomy, which I grabbed from uh University of Florida's uh, uh information science site on learning process. Um and you can see D, &D runs the gamut from from the higher uh order from creating to kind of the room rote learning remembering even from if you're running a session zero they're hitting all these points of the learning process um so when you're ready to set up the first thing you want to ask is how involved you want to be it's i've been a dungeon master and it's very fulfilling it's a lot of work uh, but it's very fulfilling uh but maybe you had you want to do it more passive i've had some libraries uh ask me about I've already have teens come up and they have their own dungeon master and they're ready to go. And how do I how do I run this? Be, make it more passive. Well, you'll basically need to gather the same materials, which I'll get into later. Um, but uh, yeah, if you're starting to, I, but if you decide to make it more active um, as a dungeon master, um, there's it's it's essentially you want to gather the materials, learning materials as well. Um, the session platform. I started. Uh, we started this in spring of 2020, so online was pretty much the only option. Um, uh, so, so we started through Discord. I created a, a server channel. Um, I wanted to build it. You know, I actually modeled a lot of the rules that the D and D official Discord channel had in kind of uh, creating ground rules. Uh, uh, avoiding abuses um, and it's been great I, I i haven't had any instances with the teens and i've also run different channels for different programs like our volunteer club so uh, just a generic uh server that i set up for teen services and it's worked out well now we've gone to more in person and we've also done uh hybrid um so the i i live in a state where you have the winter months winter weather you might have to say well, let's just do it online today guys um uh, there's also been cases where teens will say, "I'm not feeling well. Can I can I Discord in to the to the session? A gaming platform. You can go old school with pencil and paper. Um, uh, and then there's the virtual tabletops, which has already been uh, mentioned. So I'm going to skim over the stuff that that's that's already been mentioned in these great previous presentations we've had. Uh, but this these slides will be available later. Uh, what I've done personally is I've just used Excel and slides. Um, you know, when you put that office tools proficiency on your resume this is when you get to this is when you get to say you actually use it um so getting into the actual game management so this is me as dungeon master uh there's dnd beyond which we've we've seen before uh the great thing when after you get to the end of the character building in dnd beyond you can create a sheet and print it out like it looks like a physical uh sheet or traditional D, D character sheet that you can um the tough part about that is uh you can't can't write it in pencil and erase it every time your character changes levels up you might have to print out a new sheet 
So uh, I, I, the nice, uh, another nice thing about D&D Beyond is you can create a campaign. Um, so you can see other characters if they, if they, if they, if your other players, your teens want to show what your characters are doing, what roles they're making, um, die roll they're making, that's handy as well. Uh, game session management. So I basically bring up Google Sheets and this is how I, I traverse the maths of it all. There's there's really, you see of all this information over here on these sheets, there's really only a few things you need uh, to see with the characters, um, like their armor class and their hit points. This is a Google Sheets that I opened up for the map, and I just basically click and move. I use these, these uh, opaque squares to conceal areas that they haven't discovered, so there's no spoilers, but it's just click and drag. Um, Okay, so yeah, starting with the basic rules is great. It's free. At the end of the the official PDF, they have blank character sheets that you can print out uh, that, that are that the teens can just fill out by hand. A uh, player's handbook is a great way to start. I know it's been mentioned before. Even if you're a dungeon master, a great place after you've done the the after you've looked through the maybe the free PDF. Um, this is a way to create more characters with more classes. Um, and they're just really nice additions. These are the 5e editions. Um, and the expansion books, once you're done with kind of the core books. And then again, as I mentioned before, the online influencers, the people who run the the, the YouTube channels, um, those are great uh, to learn. Uh, materials. Uh, yeah, the, the, there's a D&D, &D, uh, there's, a, there's a Stranger Things kit, which is actually not set in the D Stranger Things universe. It's a D&D &D setting. It's great for maybe running two or three uh, sessions. So after your session zero. So I would I'd recommend starting with that. That's a, that's a fun one. And then the starter set, you can get a little more protracted adventure and campaign. Um, all the things, get the dice. There's, there's a cheap sets you can get online. You want to have that D6, multiple D6, the traditional six-sided die when you're creating characters. Uh, mini figures, those can be a pretty inexpensive or expensive. Here's one that's not painted. Here's one that actually one of the teams used as a character that's painted. You could make another program, have them paint them first. Uh, the teams that come in the library, they like to do crafts and stuff, like to help us with our take and makes. Um, make that a separate program. Or we have a volunteer club at the library. Maybe do a session where you're sitting talking about things and painting figures. Um, maps, grid paper. Um, yeah, there's different, you can get grid paper, you can get kind of dry erase boards that are grid. Um, blank character sheets, um, a laptop for the device. So here's spring 2020. Um, this is when my first setup, a little clunky. We definitely simplified it. We, uh, My wife and I were thinking, how can we how can we dial up this sense of cabin fever to 11? So this was our setup. Um, and this was my nephew and his high school friends. Uh, we were kind of our focus group, our canary in the coal mine. But I simplified it for online session. This is a guitar stand with a with a webcam that's just pointing downwards. And it helped with the bandwidth just to have everyone off camera. And the only thing is, is they're seeing the map with the characters. And then everything else is theater of the mind. Uh, eventually we got into the library and here's the setup. Here's an overworld map uh, with um, uh, the figures and uh, this is during combat. So then I bring out the dry erase grid sheets to show player positioning. Um, uh, I think I skipped one here. Um, yeah, promoting the program. So you just want four to six players is good. You want to set up a session zero where uh, either you or or whoever is assigned as DM can explain the game, get the characters rolling on a, a level one character before the previous sessions before you start adventuring. Um, it may uh, so you might run it through your uh, through something like your library newsletter. I, for me, I, I feel like maybe parents see that more. Um, might get a few part team participants and then maybe they can spread the word. Uh, I Sometimes you might find a teen who's been a dungeon master but wants to be a player, who's been running off sessions with their friends at home um, and then want to kind of change roles. Um, so there's always different ways to. And once you actually start at the end of the session zero, um, I asked, which I did for my with my original session, I asked them, well, how much, how often do you guys want to meet? And they said, We'll do this every week. And I thought, mm. but they did. They came back every week. 
So there's another testament to how popular this game is and how much um, they want to play. Uh, so yeah, so session zero, you want to have them ready to go for the adventure. You can maybe set up an, a kind of a venture map like I showed in the previous slide um, to kind of give them a feel of how the game will look, how it will be played when you're ready to go on to adventuring. Um, let's see. And yeah, yeah so uh, your adventure, you consider when you're doing it more like in library, you can think about like atmosphere, adding atmosphere. Bardcore is really fun where they take, uh, you can find them on YouTube. They're like Elizabethan instrumental versions of pop songs and rock songs. Um, uh, there's a, there's a, but never going to give you up is one of my favorite. One of the teens sprung that on us at the end of adventure. So you've never been Rick rolled unless you've been Bardcore Rick rolled. And then snacks, they speak for themselves. Um, and yeah, I think since I would have a little time left, going back to kind of promoting it, I, with my experience doing D and D and other teen programs, it's more about. Uh, it it seems for teens, it's more about who uh, they're participating, who they're you know who they're with at the event, rather than what they're actually doing. So I I would double down on what had said before about building friendships and. Um, is they're they're definitely far more collaborative. I find I find more of a from running an adult session in the teens. It's I plan all these monsters and the teens want to negotiate with them and they don't want to fight them. Especially dragons, they want to bring dragons back to their stronghold. And uh, it's like the wor the the wormlings. They want to train them and and so you know they came out with a whole expansion guide, Fizzbands Dragon Guide, and all these cool new dragons. And they the I they just want to play with them <laughs> and not and not combat them uh so it's it's really cool to see it's it's really um it, it's really a great group to work with with this game and and you kind of like i said before you kind of really get into kind of more like deep culture uh philosophical like what they value whether they're playing uh, a character that's that's maybe more attuned to who they feel they are or kind of branching out and just expressing themselves through through a different character so these are the resources this is the the links um guides and tips and some of the some of the uh youtube videos that helped me um as as i started and, and as i said i i actually before before the lockdown in 2020 i i didn't really know much about any tabletop gaming i was kind of more of a video gamer i i honestly didn't really have much interest before i, I knew of D, D, of course and i i thought it was i thought it was cool um but it seemed like maybe maybe slow pace for my personality but um i love it and now i'm 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 sold <laughs> and so if, if if you're if you're a person who's uh who's who's on here kind of looking for the first time at tabletop rpgs and this type of style of gaming i did it and so can you <laughs> so it, it's a lot of fun well thank you nate sounds like the kids are all right it's good to see you. yeah thanks all right. Well, thank you very much. And now we have our final presenters of the session, Josh Rackauer and Tommy Boccaccio with uh, Community Building Through Dungeons and Dragons, Perspectives from Public and Academic Libraries. Take it away. All right. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Josh Rackauer. I am the undergraduate experience librarian at Western Carolina University. Uh, we are a mid-sized university located in rural North Car uh, Western North Carolina. And I am Tommy Vitaccio. I am the supervising librarian at the Riverside Library, a branch of the New York Public Library that serves the Man Manhattan, the Bronx, and Staten Island with over 80 branches. All right. So um, why are we presenting on this topic of community building? So Tommy and I, as you can see, we've been friends for quite a long time. We've been fans of tabletop games for a long time, and we've been playing D&D, sometimes even together for a long time. Uh, and we both kind of independently have brought this love of tabletop RPGs um, to our respect, uh, respective libraries by running D&D &D events in our libraries. And we both kind of independently realized uh, that these events were bringing people together. These, these programs are bringing people together. And for us at um, Western Carolina, we've noticed that there's kind of a trend for students to be, they're a little, um, having a little trouble connecting with each other, making friends now. Um, and we think that's kind of a post-pandemic thing. Um, and especially when you're kind of located in a rural area, it's just so important to kind of build that support for um, and uh, make friends at the university. 
Yeah, likewise in New York City. I just noticed so many patrons looking for a space in the post-pandemic city. It was rough for us in the pandemic as it was for everyone. And uh, there were so many, uh, I just noticed uh, TTRPGs have been so effective in my own life and, you know, online bringing people together. And even before the pandemic, they've been very effective in bringing uh, patrons together. So I figured why not do it in the uh, public sphere with adults? So now we're just going to talk a little bit about what our programs are and why we started doing them. So for us at Western Carolina University, um, we had a couple, we had some end of year funds and I asked the Dean if I could purchase some uh, tabletop RPG books with that. Uh, he was uh, generous enough to allow me to do that. And then he kind of mentioned to me offhandedly, oh, why don't, why don't you uh, run a game night? And I said, I kind of thought to myself, okay, I guess I'm running a game night now. I don't know what that's going to look like. Or, but I, you know, I figured this would be a good way to promote this new collection. Uh, it might get people into the library. And then um, I started bringing the D&D books with me to table at orientation. And students started asking, do you run a game night? Do you have a D&D club? Do you run games in the library? Uh, and I told them we're working on it. Uh, so this fall, we ran our first session. Um, I also figured if we had staff and faculty run these games, it might be a good way for us to connect with students. And that originally was really the only community building side I'd had in mind. Um, so what do these games night, uh, game nights look like? So we just started running game nights. We ran one in the fall semester. We ran one in the spring semester. Uh, we have several uh, D&D one shots going on um, with different tables. We have staff and faculty um, running those. We've had English instructors, advisors, folks from the library. Um, this is a picture of that running, uh, running right there with DM Colin. Uh, we've had these events going. We allow students to bring their own characters if they prefer, or we have pre-made characters ready for them. We also have open board gaming going on at the same time. So there's lots of board games out. We have video games out. And of course, we have free pizza because no D&D night is complete without a pizza sitting there getting a little cold. <laughs> Through that. Uh, so why did we start it at the NYPL? Um, you know, similar reasons, but I kept on seeing uh, a bunch of 20 to 40 year olds uh, checking out the D&D rule books that we have in circulation, uh, pilfering my sci-fi and fantasy collection. And every time I'd see them, I'd be like, wait, no, 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 wait, we have programs. And so uh, I really wanted something to capture these patrons' attention and have them stay in branch for our programming rather than, you know, uh, circulating your books, which is also great, which is also great. And so during the lockdown, I was a children's librarian. Uh, and D and D was always popular online with kids and young adults, but I don't really, and people can correct me if they're wrong. I do not recall seeing anything like that in person at the New York public library for an adult program. Um, as far as I knew back, back in the day. Uh, and so I really just wanted to capture, uh, ages 20 to 40 people to keep them in the library, you know? And I thought, well, d d is really great for uh, uh, trapping nerds into a library, I thought. So I'm good for the next slide. We're gaming here. Uh, our sessions at the library, we have two sessions. Uh, every week, I have a Friday session and I have a Saturday session. My Friday session is loosey-goosey. It's for people who really haven't played before. And we get a good amount of people coming into those sessions. Uh, there's no registration required. Uh, it's kind of almost like a demo of d d It's like an hour and a half. And it's people who've never played before and people who just want to like hang out with other like-minded individuals and like uh, they've seen uh, Critical Role online, and they're like, oh, it sounded cool. But my Saturdays are for the more experienced players. Uh, that is registration only, and I have a little one-on-one -on -one session with my uh, patrons to see, okay, what are you comfortable with? Do you know the rules? Have you had your own character? That's about two and a half hour sessions. It's been going for, on for almost two years, and it's a consistent campaign for my uh, patrons, and it's uh, it's going pretty good so far. So I have those two sessions. Yeah. Um, so even though Tommy and I run very different sessions, you know, he runs his weekly for about two and a half hours or so. I run mine once a semester for about five hours or four to five hours. Um, we do do them a little differently. So, um, and we do have some shared challenges. So first off, uh, marketing is always something, you know, um, you can have come up with the greatest program in the world, but if you don't market it well enough, uh, not enough people are going to find out about it and you're going to end up with not a lot of people there. Um, 
Yeah, totally. And time management is uh, both a challenge for us separately. So I do my games frequently every week. However, I don't do them for that long. It's an hour, two hours. Relatively, that's a short D&D session. I, if we've all played, we all know the four or five hour sessions we've been. However, Josh has found success doing uh, once a semester, but for a long time, all night, their gaming nights are a big event. So each we each had to find that out separately. Yeah, crowd control is also important. Um, depending on, you don't necessarily know 100% how many people are going to show up. We do a sign up sheet beforehand, but even then we have to kind of guess, you know, if there's going to be no shows, new people showing up. And when you're playing D&D, you want to try to limit a table to about six players, um, you know, for I think a, is a good size. Yeah. Um, but you also don't want to turn anyone away. So it's trying to find that balance of how to make the game playable for as many players as possible um, while making sure not too many people are, are left out. Yeah, piggybacking on that, we don't want to turn anyone away. And so if we get more than six people, if we get like 12, that's two sessions, that's two player bases right there. So finding out who is comfortable to help you out to be in uh, a another game master. So if, if it could be like your colleague, it could be um, your patrons uh, uh, to volunteer. It could be a page who's done shelving for the day. Any one of those, it's it's really helps uh, solve one of the challenges that we have with crowd control. Yeah, so now let's move on to the actual the community uh, community building aspect of this um, presentation. So uh, first off, uh, we've run these events twice at WCU, and we noticed right away that there was this really awesome community building side of things. We started seeing students talking to each other, uh, exchanging phone numbers, making plans to get together again. We've seen students who attended the event now coming to the library to play D&D. Um, one of our student workers actually now runs a campaign with somebody that he met at the event. So just even anecdotally, we were seeing this um, happening, but we also did a survey, of course, because this is academia and we have to do surveys. Um, and our first event, we had 45 attendees, 19 out of 34 of the responses we got talked about some sort of social aspect of the um, event, like making friends and just a couple of the quotes. I like being able to be with a group of people who are also like tabletop gaming. It was very inclusive and well-prepared. I had a lot of fun. It was able to connect with people, which is pretty much everything I ever wanted to hear in a quote about one of my programs. Um, I've been looking for a group to play D&D with for a while, and it was super exciting to get to play Smiley Face. Um, for a second event, it was very similar. Uh, we had 41 attendees, 15 out of 27 of the responses, talked about the social aspect. Um, I love getting to meet new people that enjoyed the hobby and the opportunity to role play. It was epic, love meeting and playing with new people. And I liked how immediately welcoming the environment was. As a new player, it really took away the intimidation aspect. Yeah, um, for on my side, uh, really mine's anecdotally. So like I would have quite a lot of people coming in on average, at least 10, 15, depending on the session. Uh, right off the bat, my patrons were like, I was doing it once a month because I didn't think it would hit off the ground. We had a lot of stuff to do in the library, but my patrons were like, why aren't we doing this every week? I'm like, well, dang, okay. Uh, so that was uh, great feedback, especially this was coming during a time that was uh, a little difficult to get people back in the library after the pandemic. Um, and one really cool thing that I consider feedback is the intergenerational mixing I see outside of this program now. So it, it almost sounds like a joke, right? It's uh, a, 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 a rabbi and a, and a librarian walk into a D&D &D session, and, but that's actually how it is. Uh, I know a lot of my patrons have uh, mixed with people in the community that they usually don't, and they've hung out outside the library. They go to different library programs like our knitting circle, our craft work uh, program, and I've even seen them in my uh, 3D printing programs. As you can see, I've 3D printed all of the tabletop stuff with our library, and I saw them there. It really encouraged people to mix with with everyone and just share in their neighborhood. Yeah, um, and we also just have a couple of quick tips and tricks for just kind of fostering community within your game. So um, I just want to let everyone know just running this game is half the half the battle. If you can run a DD and d game, it's very much an inherently social um, event, social game. If you can do that, um, you're already halfway there. So I think it's one of those things that just anyone can do. Yeah, uh, and when you have that uh, program already set, it's important to really manifest everyone making feel comfortable. I think uh, we've both had the experience with our patrons showing a little anxiety over it with if they've never played D&D, uh, because there is a little uh, 
uh, uh, people are afraid of gatekeeping, right? But we do as much as possible to dispel any of that because the library is for everyone just like the Indias. Yeah, and we found that it was really helpful to just let the GMs, um, the game masters kind of make the game their own. So every table ran the same one shot, but everyone kind of did it in their own way. I used my own little miniatures that I painted. As you can see by this picture, one of our D uh, GMs uh, made little arts and crafts things to use at the table. Um, so that just let us kind of open up and be ourselves, connect with our students a little bit more. And a looser and happier GM is makes for a better game for everyone. A hundred percent. And that goes for us too, the program leaders, uh, even if you're not being the DM at the moment. Uh, it's important that everyone has a good time. It doesn't matter if it's perfect or not. Um, it could be just a silly community building one shot. As long as the person can uh, roll a dice either physically or virtually, uh, it doesn't matter. It's You're there and uh, you're having fun. Yeah, uh, we also like to make sure we're supporting our shy and anxious players. We've definitely had a few of those attend uh, come to both of our tables. Um, one of the things we do is we have a sign-up sheet um, to sign up for these events. Um, and we make sure that if they want to sign up to be with their friends, they can sign up to be with their friends. We've had uh, a few shy or anxious players like kind of request to be with the game master they're familiar with. So either a librarian or a professor or an advisor that they know. So it makes them a little bit more comfortable. We also really encourage role playing. So um, if you know they do something at the table, we give them the opportunity to like you know explain how they killed the monster or how they did something specific, which gives them an opportunity to kind of participate and talk and be themselves without having to necessarily interact directly with someone. Yeah, and in that, and when you're playing, it's with our shy and anxious players. Uh, it's no need for them to know every single one of the rules. Um, it's it's uh, it can I can't recall the amount of times I've let my patrons do something ridiculous just so they feel powerful. It's OK. Uh, and if you don't know who is feeling more or less comfortable in these games, have a one on one reference session with them. If you have a session where they're registered, give them a call. Be like, hey, are you coming to this session? That's great. By the way, have you ever played before? All that sort of stuff, it helps a lot when you're trying to visualize what your session is going in. Sometimes if it's if they don't know any of the rules, I just wing it and just do like a smattering of the session. It's as, as I said before, you can treat it like a demo. You can give it like a little tasting of what it could be before they get hooked onto the game. Yeah. Um, we've also had a lot of success involving local game shops. Um, game shops tend to kind of be like the heart of any gaming community. So it's really special that you can kind of make that introduction to your students and your players um, as a space. So we were able to bring a local game shop, Tollguard Games, in. Uh, they were brought in extra board games and taught students how to play new board games, uh, which was really great. They also did little small giveaways, which was kind of fun. Yeah, and uh, I've used my local game store in the Upper West Side to just post flyers, 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 and flyers. Uh, they're my best friend. Uh, I post them everywhere. They've uh, allowed me to do that as well, um, as well as uh, comment on their Discord and uh, their Reddit and stuff like that. Speaking of comments, we do have to leave some time for yep. them. So I, I see that look, that. Thomas. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, no, that's why we're on the final thoughts. thoughts. Um, so just very quickly, uh, for us, D&D has just been an amazing way to build community for our patrons. Um, it's okay if it's not perfect. Um, half the fun of D&D is making mistakes. Yeah, and if you if you build it, they will come, right? Uh, the every as long as you make this, people who uh, if you've marketed will who enjoy it will uh, be a part of that community. And D and D uh, community is part and partial of uh, D and D. How can you not feel close to someone after you just slayed a dragon with them? Come on, if you can do that, you're golden. Thank you. Cheers. Oh, well done. Thank you guys very, very much. We appreciate that. So now is the time for uh, everybody to be submitting their questions using our Q&A feature down here at the bottom. So um, please go ahead. If you have questions for any of our panelists today, we would love to hear them. I'm sure they would too. So please go ahead and submit them down below. And if you have questions for each other, you know, that always flies too. So... <laughs> There's a lot of really great information there to uh, parse. I know I've got a lot written down here in my notes. So, <laughs> any questions? Oh, 
Okay, I've got one here. Um, somebody asked, uh, could you give your favorite D&D resources? I, I can I can go. Uh, I love this um, uh, this module called Wild Sheep Chase. It's on DM uh, Guild. It's free. Uh, it's I believe there's also an open source uh, license that the Creative Commons license that the creator is like go for it. And it's really wacky. It's really goofy. It's really quick. It's about a uh, a, a um, wizard being turned into a sheep and so it's easy to show new players how easy and wacky D, D can be it's not all like you must slay the dragon you know it can be like save the sheep man come on so it, it's really accessible yeah i just want to uh, tommy had told uh shown me wild sheep chase um when i had asked him what's a good one shot to run in the library um and we had a lot of luck with that um, we've also kind of used um, some of the other modules they um, that the same author created. And if you're looking for just like a like a quick three to five hour, not, not that five hours quick uh, game to play for a one shot, it works really well. I was just going to add um, two great resources that I've found a lot of success from it with, with like referring my patrons to it as well as just for myself is one is a rule 20, which is a virtual tabletop. It's more importantly, it's free. I love using platforms like Foundry. And I know that uh, D and D beyond is like rolling out there that they just recently announced. Um, but rule 20 is a great resource. That's totally free to get used. And they've got assets in there. The other one is actually the um, D and D uh, subreddit on Reddit. Um, the biggest reason I say that is because there is a lot of really excited people who are happy to gather on there, um, connect with others, but uh, you get a lot of great artists who have like created content that are excited to share it with folks. And they're just trying to get a spotlight because it's a big platform for um, a big community of folks who are interested in D&D. So both are great resources. I'll throw links in chat for both of them, but um, some of my favorites. Cool. Erica, did you have anything you wanted to recommend for general TTRPG stuff? I actually don't, because Wonder Home's kind of my new religion, I could argue. Uh, I Seems like a really, religion, I'm really loaded, but I, I really just play Wonder Home now. Um, D and D, I was never a D and D runner, so I don't really know that much about uh, resources. I Are there know. any resources that supplement Wonder Home specifically? Um, I in both uh, the uh, PowerPoint and in the script that I kind of turned in with it. There's a Wonder Home. Uh, page where anybody who wants to create third-party content uh the creator jay dragon actually like opened it up and was like hey if anybody wants to create extra content here's the page to publish it on um so i did link that um awesome. so that if anybody wants to kind of look at what the game offers and are like there's a couple things missing there's a whole bunch of stuff on this itch.io page uh some of it's free some of it's only like there it is. Bucks. it's really great yes thank you so we had a request in the quick q a uh, nate can you show that dice folder again please There it is. Awesome. Thank you. It's a little, it's it, once you lie it down on the table, it's a little more stable, but yeah, it works really well. I got a couple of them. <laughs> All right. We got another question here. What kind of D&D rule books would you recommend for a library that's just starting to collect them? I mean, aside from the, the core rule books, what, uh, what rule books would you recommend for a collection? Um, so we just did that. It kind of depends on how much money you have, I would say, but I would say the D and D core rule books are obviously pretty important. Um, we also purchased the, the Pathfinder uh, second edition book. That's been pretty popular in our library. Um, we, um, cyberpunk has been a little popular because of the video game. Um, so we, I've had someone actually at my table, uh, who is a kind of her, a forever DM who's now running a cyberpunk DM, uh, game uh, and he's using our library copy. Um, those have been our two most popular RPG books uh, outside of D&D. Uh, &D. All right. Well, let's see. Here's another question. For the sake of people who want to watch D&D &D before they start to join a program, do you have other channels or creators to watch that aren't Critical Role? Critical Role, they say, is intimidating to get into. If nobody else is going to jump in, I will. Um, so like as I was finding, trying to find like these live play uh, examples of Wander Home, I think there, there are a lot of people who kind of do 
a series of live play or actual play of like a bunch of different games. Uh, I think it's Dicebreaker was one of the ones that I ended up linking to. And I know they do a bunch of different games. So I would definitely even just Googling on YouTube, like Dicebreaker live play or actual play. And I think you will find there are a surprising number of um, kind of examples like that. I know they do D&D &D, and I think they've done a bunch of other games as well. So even just searching like actual play D&D &D on YouTube, uh, Dimension 20. There's several um, popping up in chat here. Yeah. Exactly. So awesome. I would recommend doing that. Thank you. And here's while you're on, we have a question specifically for you. Have you ever interacted with Ryu Tama in any way? I feel like Wander Home has supplanted it as the current top soft and less combat focused fantasy RPG. I actually have not heard of it. Uh, I am definitely going to look into it because it sounds like it would be an amazing companion to Wonder Home. Um, but no, I have not heard of it. I look forward to looking into it. Thank you so much for the recommendation. And then there's one more here specifically for you. You're popular here. Um, how would you pitch Wonder Home to someone who only knows TR TTRPGs as Dungeons and Dragons? That's something I personally run into, actually. Yeah, so um, like I tried to do throughout the presentation, I really kind of feel like Wonder Home is, is a much more quiet, kind of thoughtful, I've heard the term um, therapeutic, and I actually really like that term for Wonder Home. It's a very thoughtful, calm, kind of really digging deep into your character kind of a game, um, but it, it's peaceful. The idea is that everybody is generally good-hearted, and there's no... The, the conflict, instead of being external, is almost always internal, which is a very different kind of game. And it's not for everybody, obviously. Um, but I have found it to be especially helpful. I found it, you know, right in the middle of the pandemic. So I personally found it really helpful to dig into it um, in the wake of the pandemic. And I hope that more people have now heard of it and are at least willing to give it a shot. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's disturbing, isn't it? How in um, you know, our fantasies and our escapism revolves around living in a world where society works and people are nice to each other. Anyway, <laughs> I think that that is all the questions we have today. And in four more minutes, we've got some more folks going to be talking, but you guys did a wonderful job and we really appreciate it. And um, let's see here. Uh, we're going to put a link in chat so attendees can give feedback to our presenters. We have a very short four question survey. We would really appreciate everybody filling out. Thank you all so much once again. And we're going to go ahead and take a minute and switch to the next session. Thanks for joining us.